Hello and welcome. My name is David Honey and you are listening to a brand new podcast called Unique Professions. It's a podcast where I will explore various professions and find out all about them, who are the people who invest in them, who is involved, what do they do, and their journey as well. So come along, join us. It's going to be so much fun. My first guest uses her voice as an instrument and gets paid for it. And she has been a voiceover coach and a voiceover artist for many years. It is a delight to have Deanna Cooney in the studio. Welcome, Thank Deanna. You. Thanks so much, David. It's lovely to be here. Right. I suppose we're going to jump into it. Okay. Um, you have been in the commercial and corporate world yeah. for as a voiceover artist. How did you start your journey in that? Well, I started as an actor. So, like, in my early 20s, I'm, I'm 49 now. So, like, uh, when I was – when I was actually, it started earlier than that. It started in high school from an acting perspective. I, I just kind of fell into being an actor in high school. It was a bit of an accident. I didn't study drama or anything like that. But one of my friends was, was in one of the plays and someone dropped out last minute and they, like, kind of yoinked me in and got me to play a role and, and I fell in love with it. And so I spent the rest of high school acting and that kind of thing and, and at at the end of high school, I auditioned for the WA Academy of Performing Arts, you know, WAPA, the big drama yep. school here in mm-hmm. Perth, um, and I didn't get in and I was devastated and I decided that I was not meant to be an actor and that was the end of my acting and that really it was just a high school thing that I did. And I went to university, got a degree, got a job, did all the things and within about six months decided that this was not for me and actually what I really wanted to do is pursue a creative career. I wanted to be an actor. I wanted to be a performer. So that's what I did. I I enrolled in an acting class and I went and did a bunch of stuff and found myself an agent really quickly which was just a a, a real a real like exciting time in my life you know to be able to go and do some study and then pick up get picked up by an agent really quickly and and I and I sort of spent a year getting cast in lots of tv commercials you know like just my face you know not talking very much but but just like eating burgers and throwing balls and doing you know cute things in the in the background and foreground of tv commercials and and what happened was everyone in the production side of the TV commercials would hear me talk on set and say, hey, you should be doing voiceover. And I'm like, what, what's voiceover? And like, you know, all the disembodied voice that you hear, you know, like if you, if you see some pictures and you hear a voice with it, the voiceover, the voice is the voiceover part, right? And I was like, well, how do I do that? And they just go talk to your agent, right? You've got an agent, go talk to your agent, tell your agent you want to do voiceover. So I did. I just like rocked into my agent's office and said, I want to be doing voiceover. What do we do? So what she did was find a studio here in Perth who was willing to give me a shot, right? And they got me to read some stuff, they liked it, and they kept hiring me. And I basically over the next two years got hired by all the major studios in WA, in Perth here, because... 25 years ago, you worked where you lived. You didn't have like setups like this lovely little podcast setup that you've got in this space where, you know, you can buy your microphones and all your gear and that kind of stuff. All of that was in big professional studios or radio stations or TV stations, you know. So you didn't have, you didn't have studios at home. You didn't have microphones at home. You went into big professional studios to record. So you basically just worked where you lived, right? So I was really lucky. I kind of got apprenticed. I worked at all of the major studios, all the radio stations. I did a bit of work in a few TV stations. And before I knew it, my voiceover career was bigger than my on-screen and stage work, you know. And it's been like that for the last 25 years. Things have changed a lot, though, since then. What, what kind of things have changed for you? Well, I mean, look, the, 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 the style... Besides, you know, the equipment. Yeah, well, that, I mean, look, that is one of the really big things, right? From a, from a performance perspective, the style of voiceover has changed a lot over the years. I spent probably 15 years doing lots and lots and lots of really high-energy retail stuff. You know, like, buy this now, rah, 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 kind of stuff. You yeah. know, really energised kind of things. I was the um, brand voice for... Red Rooster for about five years. So if, if at any point in your history you've heard, it's got to be red, that was me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, like, the, the, the style of voiceover has changed a lot. In the last kind of five or six years, things have turned very naturalistic. 
And so a lot of us have, those of us who are still in the voiceover industry now, have really made some big changes to the way that we do the actual craft, you know. Like we've had to really learn how to pull back and deliver voiceover in a way that's really naturalistic and sounds like a real person, not like, buy some stuff now kind of yep. things, you know. So that's changed a lot and that's really normal, you know. Like any kind of creative profession, you're going to see stylistic kind of changes over time right um but probably the biggest change to the the profession or the industry of voiceover is is digital right the the advent of of things being easy and accessible and much cheaper to access you know you don't you don't need a massive studio with like huge like audio facilities and stuff anymore. You can literally buy a microphone, you can buy an interface, you can have a laptop. All you need is a space that is acoustically appropriate and you can set yourself up at home now to mm. do voiceover for for a really reasonable amount of money, yep. you know? And that has just completely changed the industry completely changed the industry for starters there's way more people in it now yep. right like before when you were an actor who also did voiceover and you went into big studios it really capped the number of I just hit my, my coffee cup then we, it really capped the number of people that that there was space for in the industry right mm -hmm. um and and most of the work was done at that high-end advertising kind of space now that there's more people doing it and it's easier to access people who are doing it because not only does it get cheaper for people to do voiceover, it's cheaper for people to buy voiceover now, yep. right? So there's lots and lots of companies who before maybe didn't have the budget to pay an advertising agency to create advertising for them or a production company to create all sorts of different like corporate materials for them or e-learning materials for them. They might not have had the budget to pay what they had to pay before now they can hire people to do it for them because the 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 market is much deeper now mm. if that makes sense and broader you know so it's really 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 shifted the landscape of voiceover enormously and i think it's great i think it's really good it's also probably a bit more competitive to land jobs as well well like yes and no right like people hear that oh there's so many more people in the industry now it must be more competitive there's much more work as well yeah Right? Like it's not like there's now hundreds and thousands of people competing for the same small amounts of work, mm -hmm. right? The, the level of competition at the high-end advertising space where I work hasn't really changed that much. I yep. mean, a little bit, right? A little bit. It's, it's not quite the same as it was 25 years ago, right? So it has shifted a bit. But, um, but you have to be operating at a certain skill level to work in that really kind of high-end advertising mm. space. Um, and, and that's what I mean by there's, it's, it's more accessible now. There's most of the people that are coming into voiceover are coming in at the entry level or kind of the mid-tier level. And you're up right? top. So. I work at the top level with, you know, other people up there as well. But those middle tiers and the entry level tiers, there's lots and lots of people in there, but there's lots and lots and lots of opportunities for work in there as well. Heaps and heaps and heaps. So it's sort of gone from an, uh, a profession where you – like you're either at the top level or you're not doing it at all, to there's like sort of opportunity to ascend through yeah. the levels now. And, you know, I think that's cool. So, yeah, there is more competition. There's more people in there. But there's more work as well. You've just got to be willing to pursue the work. And put your name out there. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Is that part, part of it is actually putting your own name and, and your voice as well and just keep going and going and going and going, you know, to like advertise yourself? Yeah, oh, almost, of really. course, absolutely. You know, I mean, if you're going to be a freelance creative in any craft or industry or profession, you have to put yourself in front of the people that want to buy the thing that you're selling, mm. you know. So I have an agent, right, and, and that's what my agent does effectively. You know, my agent is the person who puts me in front of the people who are buying the voices, right? But if you're a freelancer and you're not represented and probably like, I reckon 90 to 95% of the, of the voiceover like industry, the people in the voiceover industry, they don't have an agent. They're, they're freelancers and they're representing themselves in yep. the space, right? Those people have to do the job of an agent as well as do mm. the job of being a voiceover artist. Yeah. Right? You have to find the people that want to buy the thing that you're selling. Yeah, and it's almost like a, you're selling yourself, really. Absolutely. All the time. 
Yeah, which is challenging, right? Because when we're selling ourselves, it can get a little bit uncomfortable. You know, mm -hmm. it's much easier to sell something that isn't like directly affiliated with who you are as a person. Yeah. <laughs> You know, like, oh, I've got some shampoo over here. I'll sell this shampoo versus like, I'm selling me. You know, there's like a bunch of like kind of weird um, like ego-based stuff that gets in the way when we are trying to sell ourselves. We get really self-like, self, self like, um, we get really insecure and self-conscious about that. And a big part of being a successful voiceover talent these days is being able to kind of separate that out, see the thing that you produce as separate to yep. who you are as a person. Yep. I'm just going to go back just a little bit yeah. and where you said that some of the vocal styles that mm. are wanted changing. Yeah. You're saying like back in the day, you know, the Red Rooster, they want that high pitch kind of thing. And now they want a kind of more of a natural mm. sounding. Can you, I'm going to put you on the yeah, spot, yeah. Give, me, give me an example of that natural sound that is really popular in the yeah, market right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, it's easier if I've got something to read, but... Okay. Um, Effectively, no, 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 that's all right. I'll make something up. It's cool. Um, effectively, what we're doing is we're going from a space where we're quite projected. So yep. the voice is really pushed forward and it's quite like sort of, uh, it feels sort of like it's loud and it's coming at you, right? To something that's very intimate and close and you can hear vocal texture in it. And can you hear the difference yep, in my voice absolutely. here? Right? It sounds much more intimate and it can still be like friendly and perky or it can be really soft and intimate and warm. But the idea is we want to hear real voice. Yep. Now we want to hear the natural texture and the natural kind of unique qualities of a person's voice. Um, and what we're, what we're really, really focused on these days with voiceover is human connection. Yep. So we want the listeners to feel like they're being spoken to directly. And yeah. that there's a relationship that exists here. We need to build that like no like trust kind of factor. It's there's still plenty of room for that like high energy, quick FOMO, hurry up, sales ending, buy this now kind yeah. of stuff. But even those tend to be a bit more restrained yeah. these days. So it might go from like hurry, sale ending tomorrow to hurry, sale ending tomorrow. Yeah. Can you hear the difference? Oh, between absolutely. Those yeah, two? Yeah. And I think with the first one, the more when you're going back to the 80s, it's also not really how you kind of approach people. Yeah. No one kind of talks like that yeah, totally. yeah, to their friends. <laughs> In fact, after a while, it's going to get really annoying. Yeah. yeah, if someone talks to me, I'll be asking them to shut up after a while. Get out of my face, yeah, right? Exactly, You'll be like, yeah. stop it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, totally. And that's a really big part of it. Like how, as a human, how do you like to be communicated with, yeah, right? Do it. you want someone in your ear going, blah, 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 at you? Or do you want someone going, hey, how are you going? Like I've got this thing and it's really good and, and it works really, really well and I think you should give it a shot. Mm. Yeah, you I know? agree. Absolutely. Great. Now, over the last, I was going to say 10, 15 years, we, you kind of touched on a little bit. Everyone seems to have an access, you know, to be a microphone, mm. a platform to sell their voice. In that regard, has social media, you know, like Facebook, your TikTok, your Instagram, mm. yeah. has that kind of had a huge impact huge. on your work? And what? Well, well, not so much on my work. Yeah, yeah. Right? This but is the funny more thing. More of the But the industry, absolutely, freaking lootly, right? Like, so, um, like, there's a bunch of different ways that it's affected it. Clients, people who are looking to buy voice, will mm -hmm. go check social media, right? Yep. The, a, a lot of a lot of video games were being cast. Video games and animations in the independent space were being cast and, and talent was being found on Twitter, right? Yep. Because game devs were hanging out on Twitter lots and lots and lots. I think a lot of them have kind of moved to the Discord space now. Yep. So Discord is where that's happening a bit more. But Discord is massive for for video games and animation kind of based voiceover, right? Like mm. all the game devs hang out in that kind of space. A lot of the talent hangs out in that kind of space and, and it's, it's really interesting. Um, LinkedIn, very, very big for like corporate and e-learning kinds of stuff, you yeah. know? So like lots and lots and lots of voice talent are using social media platforms to connect, to yeah. create a brand for themselves. And that like creation of a brand is really, really important important you know and the other thing is if someone comes across you they'll they'll go look at your social media sometimes clients want people with a social media presence because they'll 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 
use that person's social media presence as part of their cell. Yeah, as part of the cell, you know, like there's that and then and then, you know, it happens in in all sorts of bigger kind of casting spaces as well. You know, yeah. like a, a big a big company is going to want to affiliate themselves with somebody else who also has presence. Yeah. Cuz it it just like supports the the end result in lots of different ways. And I know I know you have an agent, but mm. in your experience has so as companies or people come to you and say, hey, this is an ad or this will go to commercial, have they actually kind of like directly, you know, found you on Instagram or whatever and gone, this is an ad that we want your voice, you know? Have you, is there any work from that that you've got? I haven't, no, yeah. right? Um, my social media isn't focused on that stuff though, yeah. at all, right? We'll talk about that shortly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, but I know plenty of talent that that is how they... They, they find a lot of their work. They put themselves out there. They use their social media as a platform to show off their skill sets and their <laughs> abilities and all the different things that they can do. And they have clients reaching out to them through those platforms. I think it's just as effective as 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 like things like direct marketing, as um, there's like casting platforms that you can join yep. online, there's freelance sites that you can go set up a profile on. Um, I think it's just as important that you are utilising your social media presence if you're a voice talent to, to get yourself in front of as many people as possible. You don't want to put all your eggs in one basket, no, you know, like no. you've got to have multiple fucking baskets. Yep, exactly. <laughs> and I am going to go... Straight over to, you actually do a lot of voice over coaching. Yeah. And that, in fact, that's a big part of what you do. In, I'd say maybe 75, 80 <laughs> of what you do, to be honest. So how did that actually start? How was that journey from being a voice over artist to going, hang on, I've got this skill, I've got this talent. Mm. Yeah, I could teach others. Yeah. How did that transpire and progress? Well, it, it, it started very kind of like naturally and organically. So um, I, I started teaching acting kind of modalities and, you know, stage work and presenting and different kinds of bits and pieces probably about seven years ago. And then well, maybe eight years ago. And then sort of about five years ago I had a, a, an actor reach out to me and just say, hey, she, and she knew me, right? Yeah. She, she knew me because she... She had been a, an actor. She had a friend in who ran a, uh, uh, like a voiceover production studio and she went and saw that friend and said, help me put together a demo. So they, they put together a demo. She took it to her acting agent. Her acting agent said, this is great because it was. And she booked some work. Yep. And she went into the studio to do this work and I was in there before her and she'd never done any voiceover before, apart from this little bit where she put together her demo. She'd never really like done any voiceover work. And so she thought, well, I'll just get there early. And so I watched the person in front of me, right? Cause she knew that there was someone else first. So she watched me and then I finished and I went and did, you know, I went and she jumped into the studio, into the booth and she just basically tried to copy what I did, which isn't what the client wanted. And it just was a bit of a disaster. It was an hour of like trying of, of her being pushed into places that she didn't know how to manage and she didn't have the skill set to, to be able to deliver. And, and it was a really traumatic experience for her. She didn't have a good time, you know. And then a couple of weeks later, she found out that she got paid a very small fraction of what she was expecting. And it turned out that the client had had to go and find another voice talent yeah. so she got paid for her time in the studio because you get paid for your time in the studio whether they use your your voice or, not. voice or not right so she got paid for her time in the studio but she didn't get any of the extra additional usage rates yeah. that you get when your stuff goes to air and so she rang her agent she's like what happened and they're like well they had to use somebody else so she called me she called me. She said, here's the story. Here's what happened. Can you teach me how to do this properly? And I was like, well, probably. Can you just give me a week? I'm gonna, yep. <laughs> oh my God, I'll, I'll see what I can like pull out of my brain. And, and really what I did then was spend a week thinking about my process. Like what are actually the steps that I go through from the moment someone hands me a script to the moment I walk out of the studio? What are the things that I do to deliver the voiceover that is required? right and I put it all out I laid it all out and like a big big sheet of paper and I called her back and I went yeah I think I can and so we had some sessions together and she very very quickly 
went from not knowing what she was doing to having a really functional skill set. And within a very short time, she started booking work again, right? And and now she's one of the one of one of the arms of her career is doing voiceover work. And once I saw that happen, I was like, oh, there's something here. Yeah, like, this is cool, right? So I like I stuck a little post on my on my Facebook page. I, di- I didn't have an Instagram set up at that. I mean, I had a personal Instagram, but I didn't have a voiceover coaching Instagram or anything set up. I stuck a little post on my Facebook page and went, hey, I'm doing this thing. Is anyone interested? And like people just freaking came out of the woodwork. It was amazing. <laughs> yep. So I started running some in-person workshops in a studio here in Perth. I, I sort of guessed taught on a few other bits and pieces in a few different places and it just grew from there. And you know, four and a half years later, I have a, like a, a really, really wonderful coaching business where I run a group program, I do one-on-one work with people, I run workshops every month. Like it's just, it's, it's so, so, so much fun. And I've really found another, another passion. I love teaching. I love teaching. It is so, so much fun. It's so fun teaching the skills, but then also coaching people through the stuff that comes up when you're working on your voice. Cause yeah. like, holy shit balls. We have so much self-identity attached to our voice and the way we speak and the way we sound and the way we think other people perceive the way we sound mm-hmm. and the things that we have in our head around who we are. All of that comes up when we start learning how to manipulate our voice and our, and we start learning how to read things and, and trying to have emotion in, in what it is that we're delivering. It's fascinating and I really, really love it. I'm so happy that I found it. Mm. I just want to go back, like you were saying, you were showing this person the process mm. of your voice. Mm. Has, what, has your process between now and then changed? Yes, yeah, you know, and what are the differences? Well, it's really interesting because what I've found is that teaching someone how to do something has made me way more conscious of those steps in the process. Mm-hmm. And what that's resulted in is, is, um, is I've gotten much better as a talent, as, as someone who practices the craft. Mm-hmm. I've personally gotten much better at each of those steps because I had to clarify them to be able to teach them to somebody else, you know. Um, and And it's allowed me to... It's allowed me to adjust my skill sets to changes in the market really quickly and easily, yeah. right? Like before I started teaching, I didn't have the level of awareness that I do of, of what I was doing. I yeah. was just doing the thing. I'd been doing it for like 15, 20 years, yeah. right? And, and naturally. Exactly, right? Like, you know, naturally as far as I w- it was very trained. I was yeah. very, very trained because I'd been doing it for a long time. And, and actually just before I started coaching, there was a real dip in the work that I was doing. It was at about the time where the, the industry shifted a little bit or mm-hmm. like the, the – um, the requirements shifted. We went from like lots of hard sell to that really naturalistic space. And I, I feel really lucky because it coincided with me starting to teach. And there was a little bit of time before I started teaching where I was like, I don't know how to change what I'm doing. I, I, I can do this really, really well, but nobody wants it anymore. And now I have to do this thing over here mm. and I don't know how to do that. So Part of the process was learning how to undo things yeah. and then change them and do them differently. And I don't think I would have been as effective of, at that if I wasn't also teaching the process to other people. So I got to get really specific. I got to make changes really fast. And it, it took me about six months to unlearn a lot of the physical processes that go with producing voice in the way that I was producing it before. I had to unlearn those habits yep. and relearn new ones build new skill sets and and I'm a much better voiceover artist now than I was then much 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 better like I just have much finer control and I understand what I'm doing really 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 well it makes me a better teacher too yeah and I guess when you said uh, you kind of said it or you obviously got a look within because a lot of um voice artists you said there that um, you know, you you you're looking at your own people with voices, mm. and people judge voices, don't yeah, they? Yeah, very much. Really harshly, mm. and you know, they probably judge mine too, but that's okay. And like, but you know, did that? Did that how do you actually coach that people's perceptions of one's voice? Yeah, look, <laughs> that's that's a big question, David. <laughs> yeah, 
sorry to ask the tough questions. <laughs> no, it's really, really good. It's really good. There's a, there's a few different things, right? I kind of look at it like um, knots. You know if you – like if, if something's tied up in a knot, yep. you can't just like yoink on it. You have to be really gentle and patient and you have to be persistent and you have to find the, the loose bits around the knot and then work those a bit so that you can yep. get to the heart of the knot and really undo it. Uh, working with people's voices is really, really similar. So often the first thing that comes up for people is, I don't like the sound of my voice. So the first thing we have to do is get them past that and usually – what that means is working out why don't you like the sound of your voice? What are you telling yourself, right? People often think, it's, oh, no, it's because other people say this to me. But if other people say that to you, you know, that doesn't actually have that much impact until you start saying it to yourself as well, mm -hmm. right? Yep. So there's a lot of self-talk that has to be addressed. There's a lot of ideas and beliefs around around your own voice and your own self-identity and your own value and your own worth that yep. have to be disentangled you know and so that's like there's a bit of a process there and really it's just about helping people like I don't do it I just ask questions I just say what like what is it about that 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 upsets you you know what is it about that 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 bothers you it's sort of like counseling yeah and you know mm, and it's probably like you said it's because other people have pointed it out yeah they probably haven't really you know kind of done anything about it or not that it's just even thought about it yeah until someone else does yeah right and then it becomes a part of your own belief system yeah. and you you get to a point where you're saying this to yourself all the time like oh my voice is too deep or my voice is too high or i sound too shrill or i sound nasal or i i, I don't articulate well or you know my voice is very clear you know like maybe some someone once when you were five said to you <laughs> like you're not yep. saying that sound very clear you don't sound very good and like 20 years 20. later <laughs> it's still in the back of the head it's still in the back of your head right so really it's very very much about um there's two kind of things there's there's dealing with that stuff and then there's starting to look at your voice and the work that you do as a product as a service that you provide as something that isn't about you personally as a human. Mm. And it's a really big part of being a successful voiceover artist because one of the things that you have to develop as a voiceover artist is an understanding that your opinion of your voice is actually the least important because you're not buying your voice. Yeah. Someone else someone is, else's. right? And if someone comes to you and says, that thing that you're doing, I want to pay you money for it, right? If your own idea of your own self-worth and your opinions about your voice stop you from giving that person that thing, you've gotten in the way, mm. right? And that person's opinion of your voice is more important than yours are. They want your voice. They want to buy it. They want to pay for it. Let them. Yep, exactly. I mean, if you get paid for that, that's brilliant. Yeah. Now, I want to I wonder know, uh, you know, in your space, Accents? Do you yeah. do them? I don't. Well, I mean, look, I, I I have had training to do various accents and with work I can do accents. It's not a big part of my particular kind of wheelhouse yep. though, you know. Um, if I wanted to, if at any point in my career I was going to pursue animation work or video game work really seriously, mm -hmm. I would definitely work more on building accents. Absolutely. They're a really, really, really important tool when you're working in those kinds of spaces. But also, if you're a freelancer and you're working in the global marketplace, which yeah. is definitely something that I highly recommend freelance voiceover artists do, if you're not in that kind of like really top tier of, of advertising work or, or top tier of like animation or video games or whatever, you want to be looking outside your immediate region to, to work. And there's global, there's work on the global marketplace everywhere, right? And so having capacity to adjust your accent to suit the marketplace that you're working in, very, very lucrative, very, very useful, right? So if I was going to step out into that space, like if tomorrow my agent called me and said, I'm not an agent anymore and you, there's no more agents and agents are gone and you have to just like be a freelancer out in the marketplace, one of the first things that I would be doing would be checking out the different marketplaces that I wanted to work in, determining how I needed to sound to fit those marketplaces and I'd be building the skill set to be able to sound like that. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I thought we were going to do an accent, but that's all right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I've, I've dabbled, I've dabbled. Well, you, show me yours. Oh, well, I can kind of do, let's say if I was going to be a 
character in a Disney movie yeah. or whatever animation, and I'm the villain. Okay. I can do a villain. Show me the villain. All right, children. I am going like this. Ooh. You come down here or I won't give you a surprise. <laughs> That sounds very creepy, David. It does. So that is, I mean, yeah. But, you know, I, that I'm just doing at the back of my throat. Yes. Yeah, I'm not I'm not really using any of my movement of my lips or anything like mm, that. Mm. It's all coming from the throat. I'll do yeah. it one more time, and maybe you can watch what I'm doing. All right, children, I don't know what you're doing, but I don't like it. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, all, very, it's very glossal, right? Yeah. You're doing lots and lots of work with the back of your throat. Yeah, like shaping sound and, and making your voice sound different mm. is really, really important. That's a little bit different to accents. You know, an accent is like a region-specific sound. So, you know, like I've got, I've got a very Australian accent, yep. but I can neutralise the Australianness of my accent and I can start to make it sound a little more... Like it, it might be coming from a, a British, UK English, kind of space, a yes. bit of an English kind of space. And we can go all, so, all sorts of different ways. I'm not warm at all, right? So um, American is really hard for Australians because they have what's called a rhotic R. So they say R instead of R. We yep. say R for R, right? And Americans say R. And it's a really different oral posture. And this is the thing with accents, right? Like you can mimic the sound of it, but there will be certain shapes that you have to teach your mouth how to make mm -hmm. so that you can make the sound authentically, right? Mm -hmm. So accents are a little different to um, vocal quality, which is what you just played with, yep. like that, that uh, uh, in yep. the back of the throat. Yep. That's a vocal quality thing, right? But it's all about how do I use my mouth? Mm. How do I use my breath? How do I shape things? You know, accents tend to be a shaping kind of thing quite a lot. Um, and then vocal quality is all sorts of different sort of things that we do. We might like get a bit more nasal, right? So if I like send my voice into, into kind of a more nasal kind of resonance, I can still sound Australian. Or I can uh, change the pitch of my voice at the same time and shift my nasality up into this space and this is a different kind of voice, you know. Yep. So there's lots mm. of different things that we can do. We can combine accent and we can combine like resonance and vocal quality and placement of voice and there's, there's, there's a bunch of different tools. And lots of people are really good at mimicking. At, at hearing a sound and then creating it, yeah. but they're not completely clear about the steps that they're taking and the way that they're adjusting their tools to get to that place. Mm. And that's what training is really about. Yeah. Training is about learning how to do all of that, like really effectively and, and kind of using all of those tools independently of each other, you know? I could probably do another accent, but Go it's on. a bit like uh, what you said, mimicking mm. what, I've, what I've heard. I guess I can probably do... I'm going to try and do a southern, ex southern U.S. accent. All right. All right. Howdy, partners. I got you here. We're going to go on the dance floor. Dance floor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Look, get that really like dance. Get the ants in the sound. Dance floor. Yeah, dance, dance floor. floor. And make sure that er, uh, that floor happens. Floor. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> and then I won't, I, won't, I won't go on the Irish accent. You don't want to hear that, do you? <laughs> All right, kids. Hang on, hang on, hang on. We'll start again. Okay. Hi, Irish, you know, everyone knows what I'm doing. I'm going to buy a Guinness or something. <laughs> That's so funny. I think I know what you said. I think I heard Guinness in yes. there. Well, <laughs> come on, Irish and Guinness go together. <laughs> yeah. Right, Guinness and leprechauns, you know. Guinness oh, and leprechauns. Good. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, so that, but again, that's mimicking what I've heard yeah. and what I sound. And it's, for you, you kind of patch those together, mm. you know, with those different tools that you have. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. And, and it's a, it is, it is a process. It's like, uh, for me, I'm very, um, I'm very process oriented. I like steps. Yep. I like, we do this, then we do this, then we do this, you know, and sometimes those things get twisted around in different orders and stuff. But um, I think process is very, very, very important. And Process creates structure, and if you've got structure, it does a couple of things. It gives you access to making changes at different points along the process, right, when you've got structure. It's not just like a broad brush stroke, sh yep. throw shit at the wall, see what works, and stick. So those steps, that structure, allow you to, like actually build something step by step and make changes at various points but structure also gives you freedom to play 
right? Yep. It's like it's like kids. You know, you give them you give them a playground, a sand pit to play in, and they'll create all sorts of shit inside of that playground, right? Yep. Inside of that sand pit because they feel safe because they know I've got the sand pit. This is what I'm playing with. This is the space that I'm inside of. I feel safe. I can play and. And performance-based stuff is the same. If you can put some structure around it, you actually get you get you get safety, and you get way more creative, and you get to actually play more because you kind of know where you're going, and you know what 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 you've got to play with. Does that make sense? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Mm. And I'm just going to go forward, vocal coach, going yep. back, going back, going back forward, going yeah. forward. <laughs> Yeah, that makes yeah, real yeah, sense. Yeah, we'll go back forward. I like yeah. it. But yeah, going forward with the vote coach, what, do you have any mentors that you had that kind of gave you the tools to do your vote coaching? Or was it for more you just kind of using your own skills and just going, this is what I know, this is what I'm going to do? Mm. Or did someone else come in and say, hey, look, you know, this is what you need to teach? No, I did it myself yeah. basically. Um, it's been a it's been a process of discovery for me, right? Like teaching this stuff. Um, I, I I have mentors and coaches that help me with the business side of things because I have been a sole trader freelancer for like my entire life. Right? I've never I've never run a business per se, mm-hmm. you know. So um, when I decided that the voiceover coaching thing was something that I wanted to turn into a business, I got mentors and coaches to help me with that process to help me build structures. Because, you know, like I just said, yep. structures are really fucking important. Yep. So I, I needed some help with that. Um, but in terms of teaching voice and teaching voiceover and working with people to untangle the knots that get in the way for them, I, I've worked that out myself as yep. I've gone. I'm, I'm very lucky that people have trusted me, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, lots of people have, have let me, um, I guess, kind of like work it out on them. You know, and it's been really, I've been really upfront about that with people as well. You know, like the first round of my group program, I was like, all right, you guys are beta testers, right? Yep. I think I know how this is going to go, but we're going to work it out together as yeah, we yeah. go. And it's actually been really amazing. I've got a lot of people in my kind of like coaching ecosystem who have been with me for three, four years and, and they've watched me build out the, the, the offerings that I have and they've watched me develop my coaching skills and and it's really it's really 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 lovely to have those people with me still mm. you know i mean i must be doing something okay right like if people are sticking around and still still w- choosing to work with me after seeing me at the very very beginning when i didn't know what i was doing that, that that feels really really good but it's also it's also been good for me because i've been able to see people develop over time and i've been able to adjust how i work with people mm-hmm. how i coach people you know i'm sure the same things happened with you with your counseling yeah, skill yeah, set yeah. right mm. like when you first start you kind of go uh, mm, uh i guess i'm doing it this way yeah I mean, pr- you know? practice yeah practice makes perfect as, yeah as that old saying goes you know? yeah sure it's like anything Mm. Yeah, it's like riding a bicycle, yeah. driving a car. You're not very good at it starting. You just kind of practice and practice and you, yeah. you get going. Yeah. Yeah, so that's how, that's how I kind of see yeah. it too. Yeah, I, I also like um, – I started working at the WA Academy of Performing Arts about four years ago, um, which is beautiful, right, because I auditioned for Whopper when I was 17 for the acting. I didn't get in. I went to Whopper as a student like in my late 20s to study broadcasting and now I teach there. So it's, it's, it's very – whole cycle. It's very – Cyclical, right? Yeah, like very, it's very, very, very nice. The circle has closed. You know, it's, it's yep. really, really nice. Um, when I started working there, I had to get qualified because it's a VAT mm-hmm. training program, right? And so I had to have the appropriate teaching qualifications to be able to teach in that environment. So, like, it's really funny. I was like two years into being a coach and then I went and learned how to be a teacher. Mm. <laughs> And, but that was, it was a really good experience because coming back to that structure thing, right, it gave me frameworks for constructing assessments and that kind of thing. Now I don't, my coaching business, I don't run my coaching business the same way that I teach at WAPA, but there's definitely crossover and it's, it's, it's helped me with clarity around how I might frame certain things in my coaching practice. You know, it's been really, really helpful to have both of those things operating side by side. And you're saying when you when you first start out, you, 
you know, there's a, the tier, almost like you've got mm. people who are just starting out, kind of like your middle range and your yep. top. Now, for those people who are just starting out, mm. um, what kind of advice, or maybe not advice, but what do you think makes a good voice actor? Okay. Yeah, what, yeah from those people who are, think, who are thinking, I'm just going to grab my microphone, grab your phone, I'm just going to play around with those kind of voices. Yep. Yeah, like I can't do it. Terrible example of, but anyway. No, it's good. Yeah. So, like, what kind of things, you know, starting advice would you give? Yeah. So, look, the, the first thing that you want to do is is decide kind of what areas of voiceover you want to be working in because they're all a little bit different. They all – the fundamental skills are the same, right, but they're applied in different ways. The context of each of these kind of, like, areas of voiceover is quite different. The way you use the skills in the commercial space is different to the way you use them in the e-learning space or the animation space or, like, any of those kinds of things, right? Um, Audio books are very different – to like corporate corporate videos, you know, they're, they're, they're all quite different. So the first thing you want to do is work out um, what area you want to be in and then you've got to like understand what the differences are between them because the way that you get work and the way you do the work is going to be a bit different for each of those. So it's important that you have some understanding of that. From a skill set perspective, there are some really basic fundamentals that everybody needs to have no matter what kind of voiceover space they're going into. They need to have a clear sounding voice, yep. right? You have to be understood. That doesn't mean you have to have a particular kind of sounding voice. It doesn't mean you have to have a particular level of like um, of of anything really. Like you don't have to sound a particular way, but we have to understand what you're saying, right? Um, That used to mean no lisps, no like different kind of vocal qualities, none of that kind of stuff. But that's changing now because we're looking for like we like to as 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 people listening to things, we like to hear real people, yeah. right? So if someone's got like a, an interesting quirk in their voice, it's not a problem as long as we can still understand them, yep. right? It might mean that you don't fit certain types of work, but there'll be other types of work that that particular vocal quality is perfect for, right? Yep. Um, so you have to be understandable. You have to have clarity in the way that you sound and can speak. You have to be able to read something. Like, yep. so your comprehension of written material has to be quite high. So if you don't have high comprehension of written material yet, you need to just practice reading shit aloud, like all the time. One of the things I say to people is just start reading everything you see written out loud. Yep. Just start practicing saying, reading words out loud, back of cereal packets in yep. supermarkets, driving down the road, read all the street signs, right? Just start building that connection between your eyes seeing something on a page and it coming out of your mouth quickly and easily and clearly, right? That's the first thing. The second thing that you want to do with that is start practicing sounding natural when you Mm -hmm. read those things. So you don't sound like a robot reading some things off a piece of paper, right? We want to sound like a person saying some things, like they're just coming out of our head. And so those two skills are really important to develop. That ability to read out loud, easily and quickly without having to do any like big preparation or practice it three times or any of that kind of stuff. You want things to come out of you quickly and you want them to sound natural when you're doing it because everything in voiceover is read. Yeah. Like it's all written down on a script in some way, shape or form. In some types of video game and animation acting, there's going to be things that aren't scripted, like effort sounds. And there might be some unscripted dialogue that you have to kind of like improv and stuff, right? But 99.9% of the work that you're doing, you are reading off a script. You're reading off written words. And it's really important that you develop the ability to be able to just pick up a script and start reading things out loud easily. You know, the other thing that you, you need to, um, you need to develop are those skills around manipulating your voice, Mm -hmm. you know, can you sound different or does everything that you read sound the same, you know, so once you've practiced reading and you're comfortable reading, then what you need to start doing is learning how to make things sound different. You know, and what happens is a lot of people fall into a pattern of reading and everything they read sounds Sounds the the same, same. you know, and that doesn't work. You have to be able to manipulate your voice. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah in yeah, different yeah. ways and shapes. Absolutely. So if you're just starting out, those are some of the really fundamental things that you need to get a handle on. You need to be able to like have breath control. You need to yep. understand how your breath works because your voice is your breath, mm-hmm. right? Like if I hold my breath, 
I can't talk anymore properly, right? Yep. I have to be able to breathe and speak at the same time, right? So that's something that needs to be developed. It's really important that you are connected to your emotions. You know, you have to be able to express things emotionally and let that come through on your voice. So if you're someone who holds on to your emotions really tightly mm. and sort of keeps your insides hidden from the outside world, that shit has to be cracked open. Yeah. You know, that's part of becoming an actor. I say to everybody who is getting into voice work, you're becoming an actor. The moment you decide that you're going to do voiceover in any capacity, whether it's e-learning, whether it's corporate videos, whether it's audio books, animation, character acting, commercial, like any of them, right, you're becoming an actor the moment you decide to do that because your job is to create an experience in somebody else, mm. just using your voice and the words that are in front of you. So anything that you can do to build your acting skills is super, super, super important as well. Go do improv classes, go do acting classes, like get together with a group of friends and just practice reading shit to each other and give each other like some kind of feedback, like, oh, that made me feel like this when you read it that way. Yep. You know, it's really important that you just start building your awareness and your understanding of how your voice affects other people. Mm. And would you also think maybe, not only that, but also one of the other key skills would be finding your niche as well. Like, totally. for example, yeah, like TV, not TV, uh, games, gaming, because you said gaming mm. is starting to become a big, big part of voiceover. Mm. So, you yeah, know, finding maybe what you're also interested in Definitely. and your niche yeah. as well. Maybe that might help you find your voice. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Um, I think it's really important when you first start to go pretty broad and try yeah. lots and lots and lots of different things because that is how you work out what am I good at, what do I enjoy doing, like what am I going to be able to keep doing, mm. right? Because, you know, you might think have this dream of like I want to be in animations, yeah. right? Maybe that's your dream or I want to be doing high-end advertising, right? But you might not be suited to that. Yeah. It might be that your personality doesn't work in that environment. And, and a lot of these are very personality driven. Like for instance, commercial work, you have to be agile and fast and quick and you have to pivot really, really quickly. And you've got to like be able to take direction and, and take all sorts of feedback that sometimes feels pretty harsh. Like, cause people go, no, nope, don't like that. And you can't take that personally. Yep. You have to be able to just go, all right, cool. We won't do that again. What's the yep, next yep, thing we're going to try, yep, you know? Yep. And so your personality has to work in that kind of space. You know, um, so personality is a is a really really big part of it, um, and and skill set is a really big part of it, and it's important when you're first getting into something. I think the first thing is to just start doing stuff, yep. like any stuff, <laughs> anything, <laughs> you know, just whatever. Like, just try anything and everything because that will help you work out where do I fit from a personality perspective right now. Mm -hmm. You know, everything changes. You build your skill sets and, yep. your, and stuff over time and your capabilities over time. But right now, what can I do? What am I comfortable doing? What is available to me? And, and what do I enjoy? You mm -hmm. know, get in there and start playing with those things and then you'll find your voice inside of that, right? The more you just sort of start taking action and trying different things out, the more you'll get to know yourself, the more you'll get to know your voice and how it works and what its capabilities are. And then you can start kind of moving into a more kind of niched space. And at the point where you start actually looking for work, like, okay, right now I'm seriously going to start pursuing work. That is the time to choose some niches, mm. you know? I also probably just like to touch on fear of being rejected. Yeah. Yeah. That, huge. That's huge. Yeah. You got to, have a bit of a thick skin. Oh, yeah, yeah. very much so. Yeah. But but at the same time, you've got to stay connected to like your emotional state yeah. as well, which is a, which is the big challenge, right? Developing that thick skin and not turning into an asshole, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> that's really that's a that's a challenge. A, and you definitely get more no's than yeses yep. in this game. Absolutely, fucking lutely like way, way, way more. I just got, and it's the same for any kind of performance kind of modality, right? Like um, I audition for a lot of voiceover stuff. I get yep. put up for a lot of voiceover stuff and I don't book most of it, yeah. right? I, I just booked a role as an actor in a feature film um, and I bombed five self-tests in the last 18 months before I got to this one. Mm -hmm. You know, big, big, beautiful, amazing opportunities. And I just did a really bad job of my audition, you know. Yep. And – or I did a good job and I wasn't the one that they wanted. Someone else. Do yep. you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, you literally have to be ready – to hear no way, way, way more than you're going to hear yes. Mm -hmm. And people can be ready for that 
rationally but not ready for that emotionally yeah, yeah. and so you have to work on both ends of that scale you have to like not just work on like all right i know rationally what like the likelihood is of me actually getting this job mm. right like even if it comes down to you and one other person yeah, yeah. only one person's going to get the job that's it. right <laughs> and that's life as well it's, it's, it's exactly life yeah. right it's like going for any job exactly. anywhere doing anything so it's but with voiceover you're applying for many, many, many more jobs mm. all of the time, especially as a freelancer, right? Like it may be that you're doing 100 auditions a day or 50 auditions a day or even 10 auditions a day. Be prepared for none of those coming through. Yeah. You know, you have to build that resilience and you have to develop a unconditional belief that it's going to work. Yeah, you believe in have yourself. To, yeah, you have to know inside of you deeply inside of you and you have to stay committed to that knowing that it's going to work even in the face of like a whole bunch of evidence that it's not working yeah and that's a challenge yes, yeah. and that is i think probably the number one reason people don't succeed yeah right they 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 go and go and go and go and go and they get sick of the nose and they bail yeah and who knows what the next thing was going to be mm. And also with that, I guess, and I think you can kind of understand that, you know, mm -hmm. in the kind of process of, no, 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 because there does come a point where you say, oh, you know what, putting this in the too hard basket, yep. you know, I've mm -hmm. been there, I've done that before, yes. you know, and then, you know, maybe that isn't the right time, but then maybe it's an opportunity they come back to yep. as well, yep. you know, and then, you know, kind of let's go again. Yes. You can always get back on the horse. Mm. Right? Like always, always, always. And these skills, it's really interesting, right? Like these skills are what I call perishable skills. Mm -hmm. So they fade over time. If you don't use them, you kind of lose them. They don't go away completely though, right? Yep. Like once you've built a, a, an electrical pathway from your brain to some part of your body that exists now, right? It gets rusty if you don't use it regularly, right? Like if you think about it like roads, you know, like the, the, the skills that you have are, are built on electrical pathways ways that exist from your brain to other parts of your body right and they're like roads the ones that we use all of the time turn into six lane super highways right because we're just chucking electricity down them time after time after time after time any habit you have six lane super highway in your in your body right the ones that we don't use very much get overgrown and they like collapse and the road falls apart and the trees grow through and before you know it, you've got a forest with like a, a barely seen path and if you want to reinstate that thing you've got to go back and hack away all of the all the forest and you've got to rebuild the roads and you you know you've got to chuck electricity down that pathway again so if you can stay in it right? If you get that pathway up to like a, a single lane road and then you, you decide that you need a break because you're, you're not coping with all of the rejection or it's too challenging for you or you need money and you have to go get a different job or something like that, you have to understand that over time that's going to that's gonna get a bit overgrown, mm -hmm. right? But if you can find a way to stay in it, you don't lose any of it. You just get to keep building. And it might be slow, right? That road build might be slow, 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 little bit by little bit. But if you can find a way to stay in it and keep using the skills, you'll be ready when the opportunity comes. The road will be there for you to travel down when the opportunity arises, when you get that yes. You know, mm. you have to be in it to be able to take advantage of those opportunities. Yeah. You know, and, and keeping your skill sets fresh is what does that. This is one of the reasons why I say to people all of the time, have as many different avenues for like income streams and, and ways that you build your skills and that kind of stuff, as many as you possibly can. I, I personally think as a creative, you have to have multiple revenue streams. Yep. You have to, you know. I am a photographer, professional photographer, have been for like 15 years. I'm an actor screen actor i'm a presenter i'm a voiceover artist i'm a voiceover coach i also am a speaker and an mc i teach at the wa academy of performing arts i do lots of different things and i always have and it's been very important to me for a long time that that i do that because i don't want to lose my access to yeah. being a creative I don't want to lose it. So, and I'm always doing workshops with other people. I'm educating myself. I'm doing training all the time. It's really important that you find as many ways to stay in as you can. If it's something that you're committed to, if it's a dream. But, you know, if you fall off and you decide you're going to get back on the horse, get back on. Just yeah. understand that it's going to take a little bit of, a little bit of work. To a little get bit of refresh. Yeah, exactly. Okay. 
I've got one more question before we go. Okay. How do people uh, find out about your services and book you as a voice coach? Well, if you want to book me as a voice coach, just come find me on Instagram. Yep. I'm at Deanna Cooney. It, same on Facebook as well. I'm like Deanna Cooney everywhere. Yep. Right? Um, I have a website, deannacooney.com.au. You absolutely can go jump on there. You can book a call with me. Um, I've got some free resources that you can download that are really, really useful for like, you know how we were talking about what do we do at the start? Like if, yeah, we, if we're exactly. interested, like what do we even, eh, yep. you know. So I've got some free resources. They're just downloadable PDFs, but they've got information about what it takes to be a commercial VO, um, what it's like working in the profession. Here are some things that you can start practicing and ways that you can start building your skills, you know, um, and they're really, really helpful. Um, if you want to find out what it's like to work with me, I, I run monthly like workshops or trainings or whatever. Please come and do one of those. Um, but just reach out and have a chat with me. I'm, I'm always available to like talk with people in my DMs. I, I just, I love talking about voiceover and yeah. <laughs> So, so just come find me and we'll have a chat and, and, you know, if I'm not the right coach for you, I will refer you to the person that can help you, mm. you know, like I've got a really good network now of, of other coaches and other people that work in areas that are a bit different to me. You know, if what you need is business coaching, I've got beautiful people that I can refer you to. If what you need is like support in the animation space, I've got beautiful people I can refer you to. So yeah, just come have a chat and we'll, we'll see what it is that you need and make sure that you get it. And yeah, and I'll also uh, put uh, up the links yeah. um, as well when we have this podcast episode up and running Great. as well. So, yeah, thank you so much for your time today. No it was worries. an absolute treat. Yeah, good. It's been so lovely talking to you, David. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you.